We're recording this the night before November 3rd, the final day of the presidential election of 2020. And I want to do something unusual with you, Bill Whittle, the host of Bill Whittle Now, or maybe I'm the host of Bill Whittle Now. One of you us are, is the in host. Fact. I'm the interlocutor. You're the guest. And uh, here's what I want to do. <laughs> See, uh, back in 2009, I think it was, I ran for yep. office in a local level. And uh, it was the first time running for office. I was running against the most popular politician in the county, uh, save perhaps our congressman. And he was very well funded. I was not. And the TV reporters showed up at my election night festivity, which was at a local pizza shop that had made itself available to us for free. And uh, they came in and they said, listen, uh, they didn't say this right out, but the upshot of it was, you're going to lose by 20 points tonight. And so we really can't hang around here all night. So would you mind if you would, uh, we're going to ask you two questions and you can answer it either way. So we're going to ask you about what, you know, what you felt about the loss. And we're going to ask you what you felt about the victory. <laughs> and so they knew they'd only be using one piece of this tape. Um, and so I want to do the same thing with you, Bill, but instead... I want to talk to you in terms of, of President Trump's campaign. And first of all, let's start off with kind of the concession side of things. Um, should things not go well for you tonight? And we'll cut all this stuff out and just play the, the part. No, we're going to play them both, obviously. <laughs> so anyway, um, why do you think that President Trump lost the election this year? There's no question in my mind about that. Um, the... The country is real. We talk about the country divided in half, but it's really divided more or less into thirds in terms of the demographics. There's the blue third, the red third, and the purple third in the middle. And uh, if we record this Monday night and President Trump loses the election on Tuesday, it's because big tech, big media, and the deep state were able to suppress enough news and to construct a narrative that allowed the middle purple third of the country to go to the blue. Uh, that is beyond any question in my mind. And, and just as one Two, two data points of evidence. One of them is the entire suppression of the Hunter Biden uh, laptop, which would be grounds to, to have that candidate serious, ask some serious questions, which didn't happen. And the second one, I think, is, is this idea that, that Trump somehow botched the COVID-19 ep epidemic when we were told that two and a half million Americans would die and the, the, the narrative has been constructed and many people believe it, that he totally botched the, um, the uh, COVID-19 thing. So if Trump loses, then uh, I don't think that there's anything to be said other than the fact that big government, uh, uh, deep state government, the FBI, and this isn't fantasy either. I thought it was fantasy in 2016. I was wrong about that. The deep state, uh, the FBI, in cooperation with big tech and in cooperation with the mainstream media and all the rest, managed to convince that middle third that they were right and um, and we were wrong. Now, I know you're you're still in the grieving process, and there are many stages of grief to go through over this loss. But uh, Bill, I can't help but thinking that what you just said sounds like what losers say after sports events when they blame the referee, when they don't take personal responsibility for the loss. You're saying there's that the president himself had no part in this uh, surprising upset victory by a, a sleepy Joe Biden who almost got washed out of the primaries. I have not seen any presidential candidate draw the kind of people or the kind of enthusiasm that Donald Trump has drawn at his rallies. I didn't see this from Barack Obama. So if you're telling me that somehow this is Donald Trump's fault, then all I have to say is, well, he is a human being like everybody else. But in terms of a political movement, I've never seen anything like it. And I don't think anybody else has ever seen anything like it either. I do not for a moment recall anything during the Obama administration, the two elections that uh, that Barack Obama ran in for president that matched the level of enthusiasm of uh, of Trump supporters. And and to the degree that you can say, well, he if he'd been more uh, erudite or more whatever, more under control with the tweets, then um, then he might have won the election. But if he'd done that, he probably would have lost the the people who have been so fired up for him. And uh, and I'm I'm one of them. Uh, I, I, I think the campaign one way or another, the campaign turned after Donald Trump recovered from COVID-19 and two days later was out at Sanford. That Sanford rally for me was when um, I felt like we were firing on all cylinders and that, and that any reasonable just any reasonable telling of the actual history of what happened with COVID-19, the economy and all the rest would have put D Donald Trump into uh, into 80 uh, percent category. But but that's not the headwind we faced. 
Do you think it's possible that there's kind of a two-edged sword in having such a passionately enthusiastic base? In essence, that uh, the president painted himself into the corner with his base because any effort to reach out um, to others who were not already part of the base would be seen as equivocation by the base. Do you think he kind of, he sort of designed the, uh, the sword that he was about to fall on? Again, since this is a hypothetical, because I don't think this is how the election's going to go. But if you if we're talking about a hypothetical case where Donald Trump loses the election, then I would say, no, there is no middle there. And I'm not saying if you're not on our side, you're on the other side. I'm simply saying this. There is the progressive political party in their agenda. And then there is the mainstream news media, which is a, a party to that and, and an accessory to that. And there are elements in the deep state and so on. And Donald Trump has to fight against the media. And he has to fight against his own government. He has to fight against um, big tech. And he has to fight against all of these things. And, and the only way for him to do that is for him to attack them. And we have spent 50 years watching these left-wing institutions grow in power because nobody ever attacked them back again. Donald Trump was the first politician who ever went at the press with the understanding that, that my friend Andrew Breitbart had clear as day, and that is the press is the enemy. They are the enemy of American democracy and freedom. They're not an en the enemy of Republicans. They're the enemy of the entire idea of self-government because when they start playing this kind of um, pushing of stories that aren't true and burying stories that are, then then you you cannot have a you cannot have a self a government that, that where the people are responsible for electing their own officials if those people don't have information and if that information is as corrupted as it has been then you simply cannot have uh th then there is literally a no win scenario so trump had no choice but to go to war against the media uh and and if it turns out that the that the democrats carry the election on on election day then we know that the power of media big tech and and the deep state is so overwhelming that we have to start thinking about an entirely different strategy. And that strategy is no longer one of persuasion, and it's no longer one of trying to stop this thing from going over the cliff. It's a question of cutting the cord and letting that blue America go right into the hell that it's created for itself. It's a world of smashed windows and burning riots and watching what you say and staying terrified and not having a chance to have a go to a prom or watch a football game ever again. That's the world they've made for themselves. And if half of the country or more wants to go to that place, that's their business, but we're not going. And that's an entirely different story. Okay, so let's switch to the other side now. President Donald Trump re-elected to a second term, stunning all the pundits and pollsters since he appeared to have been losing in some cases by double digits nationwide and in the important states where it really mattered. Joe Biden looked like he was up, but that silent group of voters rose up as President Trump predicted they would and carried him to victory. What do you say, first of all, uh, Bill, how did President Trump take what looked like the worst year any president could ever possibly have and turn that into victory on November 3rd? By refusing to be defeated by it. When you go to it, when you, like I said, that Sanford event was a defining moment at that first of the Donald Trump uh, rallies after he recovered from COVID-19, like 24 hours after being released from the hospital. That was a turning point because it showed that not only that this man was was much more vigorous, physically vigorous, and, and infinitely more vigorous intellectually than his opponent, but it also showed that he's going to go out there and he's going to have fun and the people coming are going to have fun. You said it yourself when you were on um, Right Angle where you're not forced to wear this horrible, horrible drag costume that we put you in on this show. When you get to be yourself, you pointed out very clearly that it's actually more trouble to go to a rally than it is to go and vote, significantly more trouble. And people have been turning out in record numbers. In Pennsylvania, a town of 14,000 people had 50,000 people come to the rally. So so what, what happens, Scott, in, in the case of the Trump win is that Americans realized that this was no longer about Donald Trump. This is, this is a fight for America. If Donald Trump wins big, and I believe he will, as we record this on Monday night, then it's because large numbers of people who didn't vote for him in 2016 voted for him enthusiastically in 2020. There was some slippage. I've heard of anecdotally a few people who did vote for him and are not going to vote for him anymore, but those numbers are grossly outweighed by the numbers of people who didn't vote for him or did so unenthusiastically in 16 and now crawled over broken glass to get to him. But on a much larger scale, this election was about which kind of America you want to live in. Do you want to live in America of a police 
with the police force or do you want to live in America where the streets are ruled by protesters? That's the that's the election. And and you want to throw COVID on top of it, COVID-19. You not only get the choice of do you want to live in a, in a world of law and order or do you want to live in a world of burning uh, cities? You also get do you want to live in a world where you accept the risk and face the possibility that, yes, now there's a new way to die thanks to the Communist Party of China? Or do you want to live in a world where you are forced to stay home, not show your face, not go to football games or dances or proms or any of that stuff, obey the orders of the authorities until they decide to let you out again? And they never will. So that's what the election was about. And um, and really, if you really want to boil it down to the simplest things, I don't know if you've seen this clip, but I, I, I saw it, it was just made me ill. Some high school somewhere decided that the that the that they could have a prom so long as the the, the boys and girls danced back to back. Did you see that? No. <laughs> Boy, the men Is that facing the latest one way, young women, dance young women now? facing the other way, arms hooked together. One facing one way, the other facing the other way, going waltzing around the dance floor like this. I saw this and I nearly threw up. Um, <laughs> this is this is this is the future. That's the future. One way or another, it's the future. And and the enthusiasm that that the Trump supporters have shown is telling me that Americans are 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 just ready to come out and, and vote to save the country. And, I, and that's what I think is going to happen on Election Day as we record this on Monday night. And anecdotally, you know, it's not just a question of Trump having huge numbers. If Trump had huge numbers at a rally and Biden had huge numbers or even good numbers, you could say, well, but when he when he and Harris together can't turn out 20 people and Donald Trump has rallies consisting of 12,000 people and he's not even there, then Anybody who pretends to be shocked by this is somebody who believes in, in computer models. A, a poll is a projection. It's a model. The only actual data right now before the election is what is happening in terms of the real world. And in the real world, Donald Trump is pulling huge numbers of highly enthusiastic people and Biden's not pulling anybody. I went to, um, to a restaurant in Malibu yesterday uh, and, and I saw a number of yard signs for local uh, officials. Uh, f driving from, from the valley to Malibu and back, I did not see one Biden lawn sign, not one. I did not see one Biden bumper sticker. I saw them everywhere for Hillary, saw them everywhere for Obama, not one. And when I got to this restaurant, now this is not proof that the election is going to go the way I want, but it is interesting. I was standing in line with a young Mexican fellow and the service was very slow because they closed the restaurant. It was takeout only. You'd go eat on the beach. And he said, boy, this service is terrible. And I said, yeah, the whole thing's ridiculous. And he said, that's why I'm voting for Trump. And I said, me too. I think he's going to win California. He said, I, I'm sure he's going to win California. Does that mean he's going to win California? No. But what it does mean is that is that people are openly sta stating things that would never have happened a year ago, ever, ever. And one person walked by with the Black Lives Matter face mask and people just laughed at her. So make out make that a, out of it what you will. So former Vice President Joe Biden has already given a brief but dignified concession speech. That and my question never for you, uh, Bill Whittle, is when do you think the mainstream media issues their concession speech? Because if indeed President Trump wins this thing, not a single one of them that I can think of was correct. Right. It's almost like, wow, it's a bit like 2016. Or... It's a bit like 1988. Well, and even more or, so, because in 2016, in the, the post-mortem of 2016 was a bunch of media people, uh, you know, f flagellating themselves, saying that they should have gone much harder after Trump and they shouldn't have been so tough on Hillary and stuff like that. Oh, yes, because they were just, they just ravaged Hillary. Uh, this time yeah. they went as hard as they could after Trump and they boosted Joe Biden as much as they possibly could. And somehow Trump still pulled it out. Do they need to basically lay down in, your dr in the driveway of the American people and commit harikiri and say, or at least apologize? They already committed harikiri. They, 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 whether they win this election or not, there is simply no question anymore that what we recognize as a journalist is an agent of, of socialism. There's no, there's no journalists anymore. They, they have vet the farm that they could drag Biden, uh, the, 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 the galvanized corpse of Biden over the line. And whether they do that or not, they, they, look, 
the news media does not sell news. They sell credibility. You get the news from anybody. And when their credibility is so low that a guy raving on the street corner with a bottle in his hand is more likely to provide you with accurate information, then the news media is finished whether they realize it or not. They are now the most, and, and, and by a wide margin, the most despised occupation in America, and rightfully so, because, they're, because they are not only frauds and charlatans, they, they refuse to admit it, and they, and they are intent on telling you that they're the most honest people out there, but they're, but they're done. And, um, and I don't think that they will have had, I don't think they'll be able to pull it off. I think people will ultimately, when it's all said and done, they're going to come down to believe in their own lying eyes rather than what these uh, computer projections tell you. I have heard that prior to 2016, or, or prior to Obama anyway, when a pollster made a call, to a potential registered voter or likely voter, they said that the that the um, the rate of the answering rate, the number of people that would answer the pollsters, was about fifty six percent. Now it's two percent. For every single phone call a, poll, a pollster makes to try to determine the national mood, two percent, I read, of the people that they contact decide to respond to the polls. And I can tell you one thing, and that is that the people who are more likely not to respond to polls are people who vote for Donald Trump. And that's why I think this whole thing is just a giant psychological warfare campaign, the polls, and I and, and it's an effective one. There was a period there for about 24 hours when I was utterly demoralized by it, but I got over it. Well, just to finish the story I started at the beginning, um, later that night in my election, uh, my maiden voyage uh, at running for office, um, I received a call from the TV station uh, to let me know that uh, in, instead of getting thrashed by 10 or 20 points, I had actually just barely lost by about two points, and they wanted an explanation as to how that could have happened and uh, what and and had I expected that? And my answer was, well, I wasn't polling, so I didn't know how close it would be, but I knew in the final days before the election, my opponent went very negative on me, the little nobody. And so I figured he was polling and things must not look good for him. By the time uh, we shoot our next show, this race will be over, although possibly not decided. And we are going we to come back know. the day after election day. There'll be projections, I'm sure. But um, the day after election day, Stephen Green and Bill Whittle and I will sit down and record some episodes of Right Angle and we'll do another uh, Bill Whittle Now program and take a look at, it, in hindsight, of what we're trying to project with this. Uh, we couldn't do would, any of this stuff. Go ahead, Bill. You want to say no, something? And I will point out something that I didn't tell you about yet because I've been busy working on it. But I also have a, um, a brief two-minute thing uh, that's designed just for election day. Uh, in case things go south. So that'll be available to, I'm, I'm recording it tonight. It'll be, uh, be available first thing in the morning. And if it turns out election day is going badly, you might want to take a look at that video. Ladies and gentlemen, the members of BillWhittle.com have made all of these programs possible. They have stuck with us through good times and tough times, and we couldn't do it without them. If you'd like to join a team of liberty lovers that not only enjoys watching these programs and sharing them with others, but enjoys their own interaction together as a, a group of sort of constitutional uh, happy warriors, you may want to go to BillWhittle.com right now and click that big green Become a Member button. See what you're missing. For Bill Whittle, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks for watching.